That was like a, a product market fit moment. Once we built that Shopify app store connection, we just started seeing orders coming in pretty organically. Then people left reviews, so more people came in and we saw that like beautiful hockey stick chart. That's Laura, the founder of Shippo. And that was the moment when they knew they hit product market fit. They've now have over 200 employees have raised over $80 million from great funds like Bessemer and Uncork. We want to help you get your product market fit moment. Listen to what she did leading up to that. Let's stop being in the mode of searching. Let's just start building something. And we decided to build an online store just to, just to build something. And that online store is nothing groundbreaking. We just started selling stuff on the internet. And from there realized that shipping is a problem for e-commerce merchants. Don't get stuck in the analysis vortex. She continues to go in depth about how they hit product market fit. Enjoy. Boom. We're on a mission to help founders hit product market fit faster. We do this by interviewing founders that have been there. I'm your host, Adam O'Donnell. This podcast is put together by Zendesk for startups. We offer six months free of Zendesk customer support suite for qualified product oriented companies. Or welcome to sit down startup founder podcast. Super excited to hear your story about building Shippo uh, and your product market fit journey. But if you could just first take us and help help anyone who doesn't know what does your company do how many employees are you how much money have you raised yes so um let's see i started shippo roughly like almost nine years ago by now um i'm yeah my name is laura i have a co-founder called simon we're both originally from germany and um back then we started like our, our first iteration of what we have right now was an, an online store so we started an online store first and then realized that shipping for e-commerce businesses is, is really hard. Like every single e-commerce store needs to ship. But then when you get to that point, like you finally have an order, you need to like make sure the item arrives at your customer's doorsteps. You have to figure out like what shipping provider to use, which um, how much shipping will cost, how to get it there on time. And um, yeah, when we stumbled into that problem, we realized there's a, a pretty big opportunity there and and what we're building with shippo is like a, like a, a shipping platform that allows online merchants to be able to ship like like retail giants um i think that's that's part of the problem these days that e-commerce businesses are competing with the likes of amazon and and other like large box retailers and the shipping expectations have just gotten pretty high so our goal is to make sure that all of our merchants are able to ship successfully we we connect them to a network of different shipping providers. And then we we help them with tracking, insurance, like a bunch of um, shipping related services in addition to buying a shipping label. Um, the team right now is more than 200 people. I actually, I don't know how many, 200-ish people. Um, we've gone remote during the pandemic and um, are still mostly SF and, and Austin based. And um, we've raised, I want to say, 80, 80-ish million dollars. Like we haven't fundraised in uh, a little bit. So that, that one's actually not top of mind for me. Well, that sounds like a really <laughs> good thing. I, I love that you're not just dependent on that anymore, but, but what an incredible impact. You built one of the most successful tech companies in the world, period. Like, so I'm I'm really intrigued to understand how you got there in terms of hitting product market fit. But even before we jump into that, you, you said you were from Germany. Can you mm -hmm. tell us just a little bit more about kind of where you grew up, what that environment was like, and then yeah. what made you make the decision to come to the U.S.? Yes. I'm, I'm hesitating because it's a bit of a complicated story. So I'm, I'm half German, half Taiwanese. Um, my dad's job brought us um, to live in a bunch of foreign countries as I was growing up. So I lived abroad a lot. Um, I think that really actually shaped my childhood, like being able to be very culturally adaptable, seeing a bunch of different cultures growing up and realizing kind of that, that not everyone lives the way we do in, in Germany or in the US. And that like really like helped me take future opportunities really seriously when, when they were in front of me. Um, I got to, I came to the U.S. after starting, um, so in, in college, I was interning for a few startups. Um, and while interning, I, like, that that was mostly in, in Switzerland and in Germany. Um, while doing those internships, I started getting more interested in the startup community overall and um, reading just what's online on, on TechCrunch and just Hacker News. I, I realized that San Francisco is the place to be. And if I wanted to be serious about working in startups, I had to find a way to come here. 
through that um, kind of more research, of course, found Y Combinator. That's where all of the great startups go and um, found a way to um, apply for a few different like entry level positions, internship positions at um, Y Combinator startups, like pretty early stage startups at that point in time. And um, yeah, got got um, got a job offer to be a summer intern at a fintech startup. That was 2023. Yes, I think 2023. So I came to San Francisco first for a summer job. And, and you mean 2013? I'm just uh, 2013. Sure. Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay, good. I was just making sure. Sorry, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 2013. Um, and yeah, I I came for a, a summer job initially, and then just really liked the environment here so much that I wanted to stay. And I mean, staying for a foreign founder is a, a hard thing to do. I actually, um, I, a, a lot of people call me up who, who are trying to figure this out. So there are different visa opportunities, but it, it is a it is a really hard thing to do staying for a foreign founder. I, I was going to say, and how are you feeling when you made that decision to come over like, to just Silicon Valley in the US? Like, what were your concerns around not doing it? Yeah, I think after having experienced a little bit of the buzz here, I, I, my conclusion which was just, it would be impossible. It would be so much harder to start a company somewhere outside of the US when the community and the support system is so well set up here in San Francisco. It was really the, um, like the amount of like-minded people, um, the kind of, yeah, the amount of like-minded people that made anything seem possible like no matter how crazy your idea was, like people were all like seriously engaging with with interesting ideas. And especially coming from from Europe, I think in, in Germany, I was more used to kind of people pursuing more traditional um, career routes, but also people being pretty uh, pessimistic about new ideas or new business opportunities, kind of seeing all the reasons why something would not work instead of trying to explore how to make something work. And um, even up until this day, like uh, like solutions, not problems, at Shepel we call it path to green, is a core value of our core co- uh, of our company. Making sure that we find the reasons why something can work, and we we eliminate the the problems between us and success, instead of just looking at um, why something would fail. Ah, oh, that's that is so good. I take it for granted now being here for seven years, but it is such like it's a less it's not it's skeptical in healthy ways but it's like go for it like and how can i help you versus like why would you do that what happens if you don't blah 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 and you might lose money and yes yes it's it's the go for it part it's the supportiveness it's just having a whole lot of people around who are doing something crazy that makes it feel more more normal for for you to be doing something crazy as well and then i think as the company has grown it's like other people are you know, like there are always people that are a step ahead, people who have done something similar like, and, and are able to share advice, guidance, people who are able to tell you that what you're going through is is not strange or crazy right now, but it's something that every company is going through. So I've really enjoyed that support system over the years. That's so good. Well, uh, thank you for that. Help us with, before we get into the product market fit, the last thing is understanding a low moment that you've had on your journey because we all read the TechCrunch articles and we just yeah. heard about the success you've had and it seems yeah. like it's always up and to the right. I know no, that's it's not, not true. It's, it's absolutely not. <laughs> I think there is there is no startup that is always up and to the right. It starts with their big lows and their small lows. Like every, every day there are like, a few small lows that I think any startup founder has to go through. It's it's truly that ro- roller coaster ride. If I think about like some of our biggest lows or, or bigger challenges we work through, it's um we had, I think as we were much smaller, we acquired a customer that started growing exponentially. And I think that's truly like the 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 awesome thing about like building a product that is very suitable for other startups. Like when you acquire a, a startup and they experience explosive growth, you are suddenly experiencing expo- explosive growth as well. And in that moment of time, like we were extremely happy about that, very excited, and for sure did not see this as a low moment until that company um, suddenly disappeared. Like they suddenly stopped tripping with us from one day to another. And 
then you start realizing that there was quite a lot of revenue dependency on on this particular customer. And um, yeah, so we had we experienced like kind of a large customer churn as we were getting ready to to fundraise for a Series A. And like from one day to another, our our numbers look very different. Like there was that amazing growth, and then it, it fell off. Um, that point in time, we we're too small to like because our our company at the beginning was set up for SMBs. We were too small to understand the importance of uh, account management and and how to take care of customers that are that are experiencing exponential growth. So it was a, a really good lesson. Um, we decided to postpone that round of financing and to do raise a bridge round first um, to figure out how to get how to get that chart up into the right again. Um, we had a really good conversation, like a really nice and personal conversation with the startup that churned, and uh, we're actually able to get them back. So we got them back a few months later. Um, we learned a good, valuable lesson about account management and um, learned about entering mid market. And and how to take care of mid market customers and uh, yeah, but it was it was a, a few months of you know <laughs> a few months of low after that customer disappeared. Oh, I bet I when I was a founder and the first time I experienced churn, it it, it was like a a kick to my gut. Oh, totally. Um, Whenever a customer leaves, it's yes, and that's what I mean, right? By like the 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 small lows, like we have a an NPS channel, a net promoter score channel in the company where I see every net promoter score coming in. And like the majority of them, they make me smile. And every now and then there is one in there that's like, whoa, this is really painful. <laughs> yes. And, and and how do you disconnect from that? Because I struggled with putting my identity in yes. being a founder and of that specific company. So it was just like a personal blow every single time. But how do, how do you manage that? Okay, I think there, there, there are two parts here. Like on the one hand, it is very productive. Like I'm, if I take things personally, it's going to drive me. And reading those, like let's take the net promoter score examples, like reading the about the customers that are unhappy with our product will like give me the right fuel next time we're in a product review session or we're looking at the roadmap. Like this will this will be top of mind for me. So I think on the, like, there there is one part of it that is like really quite important to to fuel the drive every day and then there's the other part of it is like ideally at the end of the day when i like go to bed i'm not still thinking about this and i'm, I'm able to fall asleep and like take care of myself and disconnect every now and then and i think for for that part um like i don't have any great advice aside from like having really good team members like having a team where i know if i like if we if we talk about a certain problem that we want to fix like the team member is on it and they're fixing it. So not everything like that is not everything mm. to be on my mind, but other team members are able to help take care of things. So that's the, that's the first one, like having an awesome, very reliable team. Um, then I think there is, there is a part of just having a routine of self-care. Like I, I go on, on runs. I live near Golden Gate Park. So being able to, to go running at the end of the day, um, having something that helps you transition from, like work to now is a wind down time. So I, I try to cook every night and that is kind of my routine of now we're done with work and I'm taking care of non-work things. I I love that. Having those boundaries. Uh, it's so ironic how the things that have nothing to do with work are usually yeah. the things that we should be doing to yeah, help but us. It's hard to have those boundaries because those like Slack messages come in and I, I read them at all times. So <laughs> you it's real. It, the struggle is real. Uh, well, thank you for sharing that. So I, the the rest of the time, I really am excited to dive into your actual product market fit story. But the first point is just, can you tell me when you and your co-founder were like, we hit product market fit, like what that date was, maybe how big the company was, just like talking mm -hmm. about that specific moment. Yeah. I will go back in time a little bit. So we, we iterated on a few different products. Our like... The, the first thing we built together was an online store where we started or we were trying to sell things on the internet. And then from there, we realized that shipping is a true pain point for, for online merchants and something that's pretty hard to do. We got there by, first of all, experiencing it ourselves. And then secondly, trying to get advice from other online, retail, from other online merchants 
seeing how how they take care of things um and and kind of gotten some we've gotten some customer feedback or potential customer feedback early on then our our first idea there was kind of a shipping tool what should that look like maybe it's like Expedia or Kayak for shipping so we had a website where you could click through you instead of flights you would see all the different shipping options and we we noticed that well like you only buy one flight, but when you want to buy a shipping label, you need to buy 20, 100, 200 shipping labels at the same time. So like clicking through that interface every time does not make sense. And from there, um, we started talking or we, we looked around for, for similar kind of similar e-commerce infrastructure companies and um, decided to go API first. So I think Stripe was a great, a great analogy here of, okay, this is a, an e-commerce infrastructure tool. Um, this is something where customers just need to be able to generate thousands of labels at once. And um, yeah, we built an, we, we decided to build an API for, for like our main product. And then I think that was another interesting moment because approaching customers with an API um, we actually hit another roadblock where a lot of customers who could, who, who like a, a customer who knows how to use an API is a is a is a company with like developers that are being employed there, and those tend to be slightly larger companies. And when we started approaching those companies, I think the feedback was um, all around like who else is using your product? Like how many packages are going through your API? What's the latency? Like just, yeah, what's just how credible are you? And at, at that point in time, we didn't have anyone um, using us. So that, we, that was not a good answer. Um, so then kind of both of these things, we, we decided to put kind of both of our, our iterations together and we built a web dashboard on top of our API. And then we connected that to the Shopify app store. So any, so that, that was, I think a, a really like great moment in time because shop, the Shopify app store was just getting started. Um, there were not a ton of different shipping solutions available in the Shopify app store just yet. It's become a pretty crowded space since, but back then, like we were one of the first apps on the Shopify app store. Um, you like what that means is just that if you're uh, using Shopify, you can connect it to the Shippo web app and then you can buy labels through us. And the Shippo web app is built in a way that it's a client on top of the API. So it like, the, makes API calls in the background. And that was like, that was really like, th that was, I think, a, a product market fit moment because once we, once we built that Shopify app store connection, like, we just started seeing orders coming in pretty organically. Like the app store was a was a place for merchants to look. And then like reviews, we had pretty good customer reviews early on. People left reviews, some more people came in and we saw that like beautiful hockey, ch hockey stick chart. Um, I mean, those numbers were pretty small, but it was a, just a, an awesome chart. Oh, I bet Th this is amazing. And I really appreciate you going backwards because it it's never, it's rarely just like, oh, there you go. We're right there. But help us like going back to the, the decision to start an online store. Mm -hmm. So that was in, like, what, what were you doing in your life? Like full time? At yes. the time? How are you making money? Yes. And how did yes. you perceive that decision? Yes, we were. So I was doing at that point in time, I was, uh, like still interning at the Y Combinator startup and kind of trying desperately to find a good idea that would allow me to stay in San Francisco. Just like I wanted to start a business. I wanted to stay here. And I like couldn't come up with any like groundbreaking new ideas. So um, the like I'm still I'm still working with Simon, but Simon at that point in time, he was like we, we came up with just the idea of, OK, let's let's stop being in the mode of searching. Let's just start building something. And we decided to build an online store just to, just to build something. And that online store, um, it was really like, it was nothing groundbreaking. We just started selling stuff on the internet. And from there realized that shipping is a problem for e-commerce merchants. Interesting. It, when you were deciding to do that, you, like how long did you analyze to try to get ideas? Cause I've been in that oh, space where yeah. it's like, 
analysis paralysis. You're trying to get the perfect I thing. I know. And it's really hard. And I think that is, that is a difficult space to be stuck in. Like we're probably in there for two, three months. Um, but you, you start to over, overthink things and there is no yes. idea that's a perfect idea. So I think getting out of that spot was crucial for us. And then we just got busy building an online business and then realized shipping is difficult. That's amazing. But I, I wonder for anyone who's kind of in that space right now, what you would say to them where they're like, well, we have these three ideas, but none of them are that great. Like, yeah. how would you say to like narrow yeah. it down and then just like go forward? Yeah, I'd say like pick the one that makes the most sense. Like if you have three ideas and there is one idea you like better than the others, just start working on that. And then when you work on that, like I think like keep your eyes open for possible iterations, like either coming from your own experience building that product and you you realize like it takes you into a certain direction or start talking to customers as early as possible and get customer feedback and see what they're saying or where their pain points are. But I think it's it's a combination of these two things, like talking to customers and seeing where your own pain points are when you build. Yeah. And you were doing this, you were basically moonlighting this project while you were working as an intern? Yeah. Got it. What what about that fear of like, is it scalable? Because I remember being like, yes. why am I even building this? And just yes. the moment I started building, I felt like I was attacked with just like concern and doubt of like, this yes. is all going to be a waste. You know what I'm saying? I think there is a question about size of the market, just how how big is the potential opportunity? And yeah, I think the way we looked about it, look, we looked at it was like, how big is the possible opportunity? How big is the addressable market? And then do we have a, a, a solution that do we have a possible solution like no wait sorry i'll start again like mm -hmm. how big is the opportunity how big is the addressable market and then what is the problem that our customers are experiencing in in that space and then do we have a possible solution and i think there the solution you need to be flexible like you can come up with a solution that might not work but as long as the problem is real and the market is big mm -hmm. you'll continue to iterate and you'll find you'll find the right solution um, and we we had a bunch of different iterations, a bunch of different approaches to address the shipping problem for for online merchants. And like it it took a while to get there. But I think, yeah, for us, the, the market was big enough. There was a real customer problem. And then it was just a question of can we find the right solution here? Um, and then is it is it scalable? you you won't know until you try, right? I think that's that's kind of been a bit of our philosophy early on of like you just have to try. And yeah, you can't just sit there and, and overanalyze, like, let's just get going. Yeah. And so you're, you're realizing this in, uh, in parallel to being a merchant yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So, and what, what were you selling? What was that online marketplace selling before you were actually yes. working on the shipping? Yes. It's a good story because I like right now we actually, so we started with kind of an online store, but the the idea behind that was that we wanted to build something like Farfetch, but for independent retailers, for like emerging designers, for, for brands that you would not know. And um, we started with just, you know, holding inventory ourselves and selling one or two products on our website ourselves. But the idea was really this marketplace. And I'm, I'm excited about it because like, a few years ago, we actually acquired a customer that is doing exactly that. They're called Wolf and Badger. They're, I would describe them as like far-fetched for independent designers. And it's it's amazing because we're powering shipping for them. And like they're able to focus on building out their marketplace and we, we do the shipping in the background. And a lot of their problems are around kind of international shipping because their designers are all around the world. So it's, it's really cool to see. It's really cool to see that someone else has built that um, that marketplace that we're thinking about, but we're still playing a small role in it. That That is a really small like world example yeah. uh, that you would eventually be doing the thing. And then, yeah, that's... So help, help us. You, so you start your online store. Uh, how long did you go before you started iterating on yeah. the Shippo concept? Yeah, probably three months, four months. Wow. And then, yeah, so we <laughs> were on it for a little bit. And then we realized, yeah, we, I mean kind of going to the USPS store is is not that fun. And there are questions about how do you, like, what's better? Is it USPS? Is it FedEx? Is it UPS? And how do we do this in a way that is 
that is more scalable. How do we not have to go to the post office um, every other day? And then we we looked at, I mean, I think all different shipping companies have their online tools. So we looked at the online tools provided by them, realized that you know they they work, but their the user experience is not as um, beautiful as something like Stripe or Shopify or the other like user experiences that we were used to building our online store and and saw that opportunity. And I think the the awesome opportunity here is also that. You know, you could use one shipping provider, but when you look at the likes of Amazon or, or Walmart, they tend to use a network of different shipping providers. So the, the online tool by FedEx would like not meet that need because you want to use FedEx plus like maybe five other shipping providers. And yeah, so that was that was our realization. And that's how we that's how we got into it. And I think in, in terms of product market fit, like it's been really just iterating a, a step at a time. And um, even now, like I think there, there are new products that we're launching where we don't have product market fit just yet. It starts like we, we started with selling a shipping label and then like over time realized that our customers have other shipping related problems that they come to us with. They are around like tracking, insurance, returns, like just there is more to, to do in the world of shipping. And then we're, we're also like I, I told the story about our, our larger customer churning. We started like naturally being pulled into mid market. So there is more product market fit for us to be looking for in like mid market and enterprise segments. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you for, for sharing that. So what, once you like it's three to four months in, you start, you you get this conviction. And I love how you're like benchmarking what are bigger companies doing, like the Walmarts mm -hmm. of the world, and how can we basically bring that in a in a simple way to where we are. It makes a lot of sense on the the background, but I'm sure that that realization took some time, or did it? Did you just say like, no, this is it, and then we're just gonna like find the best way to go to market with it? Or, or was yeah. even that realization and iteration oh, over the next 12 it, months? It took some time. It took some time for sure. Also because, I mean, shipping is not the most obvious, like, hot problem for people to solve. And <laughs> we, I mean, my co-founder and I had a, a lot of discussions about, like, is this problem, is this something that, you know, is, is interesting enough that could get us really excited? And um, so, yeah, it, it, took, it took a while I remember like us saying that, you know, we're, we're not shipping experts ourselves um, and we, we don't know how exciting shipping is as a domain for the next like 10, 15 years. So, but I, I think, yeah, we, we kind of broke the tie there again about to, to just focus on let's, let's give it a shot. Like if it doesn't work, if we don't like it, we'll do something else, but let's give it a try and see where, where that leads us. And um, that's always been a, a good decision, at least in like early early stage products. I think for yeah, for for early stage products where you can't do too much of a theoretical analysis, where you just have to like see see where the actions lead you. Um, so yeah, we gave it a try, and I think what what really what we really enjoyed was kind of awesome customer feedback, like realizing that we're building something that our customers are using every day and that that they're enjoying to use i think was like really energizing early on and um and yeah over time we've gotten to know shipping as an industry better and we like we know some of the more nuanced problems and just see the ability to build software that like automates and fixes some of these very manual processes is is really exciting to us Oh, absolutely. I, so let's, let's pretend we're at like six months into mm -hmm. like the, the, the store and, and, and also you're like testing Shippo. You're excited. You're, you're beginning to get excited about that concept. What mm -hmm. were those customer interviews like? Yeah. Uh, maybe even they were before you had the realization, like what were you specifically asking? If you could like pretend yes. like I'm a customer there or, or a prospect. Yes. So I think what happened for us is like, as soon as we connected our product um, to the Shopify app store, we like started getting like real customers using the products. So that was that was the first step, like being able to talk to customers who are actually using Shippo. And like, at that point in time, I was doing customer support myself. Like we didn't have a team, it's just me and Simon. So I was doing customer support myself and I would just like 
write to those customers and like introduce myself as kind of in a very personal way as, as one of them. I'm like, they're a small business owner. I'm a small business owner. I'm just building this product. I'm looking to get feedback. And I think that approach was, it, it worked really well, um, being very genuine, very personable and, and not trying to come across as bigger than we were. Like just we're like mostly talking to people running like small SMBs as well. So it was a very, it was a very natural thing for two business owners to talk to each other and, and people were very willing to give advice. Um, I think a little harder and maybe in, in hindsight is, you know, like everyone has different shipping related challenges. How do you figure out like what is what the commonalities are and like you can't chase every single customer problem. But at, at that point in time, it was really it was really valuable to get that customer feedback. It also got us a lot of goodwill that we were talking to them directly, that they weren't that they knew they weren't talking to a support person, but they're able to talk to, to us, like the people building this product directly. And it also helped with customer reviews, like customers were more willing to give a review um, when they know they're like, this is this is a company owned or a product built by a real person and they have access to that person. That's really cool. And I'm sure just being able to have that conversation, you're you're just learning so much. How how long were those conversations on average? It it really depends. Like it was anything between 10 minutes to like 30 minutes. But yeah, quick chats and also like customers were very willing to like I think customers were willing to share feedback over email as well. So it's a combination of both. Oh, interesting. And that that also helped in that, that way. Also helped, yeah. Yes. And were, how many were you doing on a monthly basis around that time? So given that I was doing customer support myself, I was probably like handling or responding to customer questions and, and tickets like on a daily basis. And then whenever something interesting came up, I tried to get them on the phone. Very cool. Well, around this story. So before you decided to build the app that go, that went on the Shopify app store, how long did it take you to build that MVP? How many months mm-hmm. would you say? It didn't take too long. It was a... Uh... It really did not take too long, but the the first like our first MVP was uh, an API, and then once we had that API that allowed it allowed us to build the dashboard on top of the API. So a multi step process. Building that dashboard was probably one to two months, and we needed approval from the the Shopify App Store team that took another few weeks. But yeah, within three months we had something live. It, got it. But you you put the MVP live before you had the dashboard. Excuse me, the API version was live. We, and we, we were talking, API, yeah. And then we built the dashboard on top. Got it. And you were talking to people while they were using the API. It, that helps you kind of we had no no real API customers. So we like what happened was that we we had the API anyone could just sign up for the API, start using it. But when we started, when we tried to proactively sell it, people were not interested in using an API with with no other customers. So then we built the dashboard on top and put that into the, the Shopify app store. Customers started to come in through, through that app um, and it took off. And then over time, we started getting like signups for the, the API product as well. And, um, but it, it took a little bit of time. And then I think by now we, I mean, we have API customers, we have web app customers, we have platform partners that are using the API. So now is a different story. Yeah. Thank you for your patience with these. I love drilling mm-hmm. in because I think found it's I think when we look back, it's easy to skip some of the really key things where I feel like a lot of founders might be stuck in this moment. So mm-hmm. really helpful. The other thing is like how much validation did you get before you decided to build the API? And mm-hmm. how long did that process? What did you try a couple of things and then you're like, this is where we need to go? So the first thing we tried there was, I think building an API was was not intuitive to us coming from um, the like uh, online store owner perspective. So the first thing we built was kind of a, a website product that would give you those shipping labels. Uh, and then we, we realized that it was um, not scalable enough. So then we built the API. I think overall, like everything that I'm talking about right now probably took up to like a year. Um, when until we started seeing that hockey stick growth. Wow. So oh, so you started with the web product and then went to the API, yeah. got a little bit of traction there, but even then they were like, well, now we need a dashboard. So it's almost like yeah. you went yeah. wide. Yeah, first step and then backwards again. So the, connecting the dots and, and adding the dashboard on top, of, uh, on top of the API. 
That's amazing. What was the initial go to market poll like once you put it on the store? Like, mm-hmm. were you having to promote that or how did it get take? So, the initial um, go to market was very much inbound driven. And that was, I mean, I think that was also what showed us that we had product market fit, that we were able to just put it on the app store and customers would come in, customers would talk about it, they would write reviews, which led to, to more customers coming in. So the initial attraction was all inbound. And um, I think what kind of, it was both uh, a blessing as well as like, you know, when you later on have to figure out how to how to drive that growth uh, through paid or or how to how to make sure that inbound is one of your many challenges uh, one one of your many cha- channels that was um another kind of problem to solve when we were a little bigger yeah that's yeah. that is really interesting was anyone else doing this on the shopify store when you first launched your api i think we were the first app on the shopify app store and that for sure helped it for sure it for sure made a big difference that it was kind of the right moment at the right time. Like more people were doing e-commerce, new platforms were getting started. Shopify was one of them. Shopify decided to do an app store and we were right there in order to, to take uh, to take that opportunity. Interesting, because I would have thought that that would be a concern because the idea like if no one else is doing it, then there's probably not a need kind oh, of thing. But there were other products, other shipping products that you could use, just not on the Shopify app store just yet. So we did we did have competitors, just not not on the Shopify app store. We found this one channel where that was still a greenfield. That's really cool. But you but you validated because you like I don't know your perspective on that, but it seems like it's not smart to work on something that no one's trying to solve. I completely agree. Yeah. Okay. I think there's always there's always the question of like like other people are already building something, like why should I build something else in this space? But then, you know, if we find a space where no one's building anything, that should be a red flag as well. <laughs> so, so good. Well, here are some rapid fire questions as we kind of come to a close, but and th- this yeah. has been amazing, your journey. So thank you so much for sharing this. Um, how how would you avoid falsely assuming that you've hit product market fit? No, I think... First of all, you need to find one number that you you stick to measuring. And I think when you're a larger startup, you're looking at a whole lot of different metrics. As an early stage company looking for product market fit, I recommend you just find a single number that you're looking at. And then for what us, was that for you? it was oh. shipments, the amount of shipments going through our product. So it was like not even revenue. We're not optimizing for monetization. We're just optimizing for, for usage. And the amount of shipments like is a good indicator of how many people are you or yeah, how many merchants are using us and how regularly they're they're using us. So we looked at shipments and like when we saw that metric taking off, um consi- like over a like a prolonged period of time, we knew we had product market fit. And I I I think you can get confused early on with too many metrics or or find excuses of like, oh, this metric is not growing, but that one's growing. So maybe we have product market fit. It's like, no, you need to find the one metric that really like defines or, or that really tells you whether or not people are using your product consistently and just make sure that that one's growing month, like week over week. And I think that's the other thing of like, it should be growing week over week um, at these early stages, not, not month over month. Mm. And and I assume that that growth is more organic is what I'm hearing versus you forcing it. I mean, for us, it was more organic. Um, I'm hesitating here because we we have or we started as an SMB product where we're able to see traction like coming in organically. I think if you're selling an, uh, a product to enterprise customers, it, it takes a little like it's it's a different process. But yes, for an SMB product, it was it was organic. It was um, our customers were were looking for a product like ours, and um, yeah, we're able to see week week over week growth. That's that's amazing. What was the total number of months or years from you launching that store to you confidently hitting product market fit with Shippo? Yeah, I think it was a total of like ten to twelve months. So it took a while. It was a, a bunch of different iterations from this online store to shipping and then different solutions for the shipping problem, then finding like the, the Shopify app store um, and then seeing a few months of like good traction. 
Oh, that's so good. La- uh, last question is what, what's the biggest pothole that you made, like that you could share that like you think a lot yeah. of founders might hit on their yeah. journey to product market fit? Yeah. So one of the big potholes for us was like, I, I a lot of things are like kind of amazing and then you realize that there's a flip side to it as well like we had incredible organic growth like it was all inbound organic word of mouth amazing we don't need to spend any money on it and then as you grow you realize this one channel can only get you that far in order to continue growing exponentially you need to add other channels to it but once you realize that it's typically already a little too late like you realize it when it's starting to stagnate so I think I I would I would recommend or like the the in hindsight one of the um, early mistakes that we made was like not experimenting with other growth channels while our first channel organic inbound growth was still growing exponentially like we had a bit of a kind of a, a flat situation and then we were then like our marketing and paid and SEO and all of that started kicking in and then we went back up but it would have been much easier and more le- more stress free. <laughs> if we started experimenting with other channels earlier in in our journey. That's so good. Laura, thank you so much. This was incredible. I hope your brain is okay. I know we've asked some really intense questions. Brain is okay. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you want to learn more about Zendesk for startups, check out our website, zendesk.com slash startups. Also, we're always looking to improve. So don't hesitate to email me with any feedback on how we can ask better questions, guess the target, or anything else so we can do to better help you as a founder. My email is adam.odonnell at zendesk.com.